Good afternoon. My name is Yu Tin from the Center for Livable Cities, and I'll be your MC for today's lecture. The lecture was jointly established by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources in 2008 to distill, create, and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The CLC lecture series is one of the platforms through which urban thought leaders share best practices and exchange ideas and experiences. Before the lecture commences, we are pleased to announce that the Centre for Livable Cities and Santa Fe Institute signed a memorandum of understanding to apply complexity science in urban studies to better understand our city as a complex system. As Professor West will share in a lecture later, complexity science calls for a more integrated and interdisciplinary approach to study the complex urban systems and scientifically derived principles governing the interconnected urban components. Research in this area will add value to our understanding of cities, enabling better decision making. The MOU will enable CLC to act as a focal point to join, in joint research between the world leading experts in SFI and local, lo and local government agencies and research institutes, leveraging on the collective expertise to discover principles and identify potential solutions to guide the planning and development of our city. Start the session by inviting Professor West on stage. Prof. West, please. This was the uh, title of the talk that we had decided upon, but in fact, it's a little broader than that, and it is based, as was uh, said in the introduction, on a book that I've just written that uh, is uh, at a popular level, but discusses many of the things that I'm going to touch upon today. What, one of the things that we're not so conscious of, even though um, we know it, and that is that uh, everything around us is expanding at an exponential rate in terms of our socioeconomic life. So as I've written down here, just to give you a sense of that, um, 200 years ago, the United States, for example, was just a few percent urbanized, and today it's well over 80%. Um, uh, the, the world crossed the halfway mark just a few years ago. Um, it's uh, heading for this sort of 80% level somewhere towards at the end of the century. And, uh, you know, just again, to give you a sense of the scale of this, um, that's equivalent to urbanizing. If you just do the, a very simple average, this is, uh, this is equivalent to averaging well over a million people every week. So it's actually more, if you do the calculation, it's more like one and a half million. And that's equivalent to adding a New York metropolitan area of about 15 million people every couple of months or adding on the planet uh, a Singapore every month. So every month, that's what's happening, so to speak, in the next, in the foreseeable future until the, until mid-century. So um, another example is uh, China, which was very slow to urbanize, relatively speaking, and uh, it too crossed the halfway mark just uh, recently, and the red is the urbanized part, the urbanized population, the yellow is the uh, rural population, and it's also heading towards this 80% level later in the, in the century. And of course, that is, as you well know, um, that is an enormous pressure on the uh, questions of resources, the questions of, uh, of social stability and so forth, and some of which I will discuss shortly. So um, you, you probably can't see anything there, but had there been satellites in the year I was born, which is 1940, this is what a picture of the Earth would have roughly looked like. If we had light, you would see a few points of light there. So that's, in my lifetime, uh, if you would take a picture of the Earth from a satellite, um, it would have changed from this to this, glowing fantastically. Um, and, uh, of course, this is, this is all due to urbanization, almost entirely due to urbanization. Those are the night lights of, uh, of cities. And uh, that's the night lights of you. That's your night lights. That's what you look like at night, just burning away like everybody else. And of course, this is, this is of course, the origin of climate change and of uh, uh, potentially global warming and so on. And uh, this is another issue maybe I'll have time to chat about at the end. And of course, all this is a reflection of this ridiculously fast uh, growth of the population. As you can see, if you again look at the year I was born, 1940, the, the world population was, was somewhere uh, under 2.5 billion. It's now heading towards 8 billion. And it'll no doubt head towards 10 to 12 billion by the end of the century if it keeps going at this kind of rate. 
Um, and that's again reflection of this extraordinary discovery that we made a couple of hundred years ago of two major things. One is of fossil fuels, and the second was the discovery of capitalism, entrepreneurship, and therefore of abundant wealth creation and the kind of quality and standard of living that others led to, which uh, we all participate in and which we'd all like to sustain in some way. And uh, as I say at the end, I will try to put cities in the context of that, um, uh, this question of sustainability. So um, I think it's fair to say that the fate of the planet lies in the fate of the cities. And so uh, a critical aspect of what I want to talk about is a certain urgency of understanding cities in general, in terms of the big picture, but also, of course, understanding them on the local scale. And if I have time again, I will talk a little bit about that. Well, we all recognize cities. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, and we all understand why it is that they're attractive to people. There's a certain sense that there's greater material well-being. Uh, there's greater job opportunities. There's greater kind of buzz, buzzy, sexy life that exists in cities relative to a rural life. And this, is ex this has been proved extremely attractive. Um, and, uh, you know, cultural events and education and so forth. All of these are aspects of urbanization and the continue exp continuing expansion of cities. Um, uh, but, of course, none of this can happen at the most fundamental level without energy supply. Energy underlies everything. And so without energy supply, uh, none of this uh, uh, can be either, can either ha maintained, let alone sustained. Um, but uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics basically says that you can't transform energy in the way we do it. We transform this into this. We can't do that without the production of entropy. So there's a kind of socioeconomic entropy that's produced from this. Um, that is, um, there is the sense that uh, there's always waste products that come from transforming energy. And that manifests itself, of course, in social phenomena like this and this and this and all these things that you're very familiar with in one form or another. Singapore happens to be a city that's done extraordinarily well in mitigating many of these kinds of problems. But worldwide, these are major problems and are the uh, um, unintended consequences of the extraordinary rate at which we've been urbanizing. And uh, the other aspect of this is you cannot any longer uh, build a wall around oneself, no matter who you are, and avoid any of these because they're happening somewhere and they impact everybody ultimately. So one of the questions is, is this what our cities will look like in 20 or 50 years? Hopefully not. Or this, is this is what's going to happen? Um, or uh, hopefully we're going to have the kind of uh, beautiful city that Singapore has developed into um, but that's, so that's one of the things that's underlying it. Now, when we think of cities, um, one tends to think of the physicality of cities. When you think of, the, of, of urbanization and cities, one tends to think of, the, I don't know, the boulevards of Paris, uh, the skyscrapers of New York, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, so the image of cities is the physical aspect of cities, the roads and buildings and so forth. But the city is not only much more than that, that's actually in many ways, the least interesting part and the least important part, ultimately, of what a city is because a city is a place of the integration of all that physicality, that infrastructure, with, of course, the socio-economic dynamics of taking place between people. And cities, in fact, can be seen as, and I want to emphasize this, as this marvelous machine that we have invented for in, in encouraging and facilitating social interactions, bringing together situations such as we have here this afternoon uh, to get people to interact in order to create new ideas, to create wealth, and to create and maintain the kind of quality and standard of living we have. So that's, that's Singapore, that's Orchard Street, but that's the essence of a city. Uh, and, of course, it's been going on a long time, and I like this picture because that's what's happening here. This is uh, the, the, the background, the infrastructure has been there for maybe 2,000 years, and people have been doing this, sitting around talking, interacting, creating ideas, 
uh, for 2,000 years. Most of the, those ideas, in fact, almost all of those ideas are useless and pointless in general. They're, they're maybe important for the individuals, but they have almost no effect. But here's what's amazing, is that by creating a situation where this happens metaphorically, every once in a while, the theory of relativity pops out, or Google emerges, or General Motors, or whatever. That's what a city is for, is to create that, uh, to, to create the environment in order to stimulate ideas, innovate, and wealth. So here it is, and similarly, here's a picture of New York, the greatest city in the world, that, uh, where we see it again taking place 120 years ago. New York doesn't look like that anymore. Those buildings are still there identically. Those people are all dead and gone. New people have come. They don't gather in the streets to do this. They gather in big buildings and they create more wealth and ideas and innovate. That's what a city in a nutshell is really about. And the whole point of a city and the whole point of making a city is to engender that in order to increase and maintain the quality and standard of living for everybody. So, having said that, we recognize that there are two kind of independent but totally integrated pieces of a city. One is the physicality, the infrastructure, which in biology goes under the name metabolism. And the other is the exchange of information because that's what's happening in all those interactions. That's the socio economic forces at work, and um, in, a, in a biological system, that would be the genomics and so on, but that manifests itself in those social effects that I mentioned a moment ago. So on the one hand, we see that cities and urbanization create problems, but they're also the solution because, uh, precisely because they are the, not only the engine, but also the great attractor that attracts all the smart people two cities in order to participate in this fantastic process that uh, we discovered maybe beginning 10,000 years ago when we stopped being hunter-gatherers. So um, I think because of this crucial role of cities, I think it's really important to ask the question, is it even conceivable that we can uh, uh, develop a quantitative predictive science of cities in the sense that I'm talking as a physicist quantitative, predictive, analytic, and, and uh, based on uh, data and so on, and involving some of these big ideas that I've written down there, and maybe many more, and apply that not only in the big picture, but down at the nitty-gritty level of dealing with individual problems in individual cities. Now, the typical way in which we do that is we break everything down into these boxes. This is the classic way of doing it. We have all these boxes, and I just, this is some of my arbitrary choice on my part. But, um, you know, within those boxes, each one of those could be a box, each one of these things. And each one of these is treated almost independently. Just as in a university, we divide up uh, the, 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 our, our way of understanding the world around us into departments, and each department divides itself into sub-departments and so on. And so it is with this, and that has been extremely successful up to now. And I would argue that now we are facing some uh, truly major problems, um, and the pace of life has increased so much so that we need now to really make a significant change and start to integrate these and see each one of these not only as a system of themselves, and in fact as a system that is continuing to adapt and is highly complex, but that each one of these is like that, but the whole thing together is itself a complex adaptive system. So that's what I've said here. So I want to switch gears slightly because I want to take it out of the context of one's prejudices about cities and uh, social behavior and switch to something uh, that uh, we uh, understand uh, a little deeper, and that is biology, our own bodies and the ecosystem around us and so on. So here are some questions and, um, I, uh, about biological life, which I'm going to touch on briefly. Um, <coughs> I bring them up because it's immediately obvious that if you ask the question, can there be a science of cities in the sense that I just described, which is very much a physicist view, um, that's almost certainly impossible in the, if we take that literally. That is, the idea that there's kind of a Newton's laws of cities is almost ridiculous, I would argue, meaning 
that we have a bunch of principles from which we can write down some equations or do some mar marvelous computations and predict with absolute certainty what the outcome will be. That's the way physics works, and that's the way almost much of the infrastructure around us works in detail uh, that we're able to do that. You, that's the way your cell phone works, of course, the way we understand uh, the way satellites work, the way we understand how signals are transmitted and so on. That's not what we can do for understanding the dynamics and organization of cities. Um, so, but nevertheless, it may be that we can suggest questions and uh, think of problems where we only need what I would call a coarse-grained answer. And so to introduce that, I want to turn to biology and ask questions like this. So for example, I can say with certainty, everybody in this room will be dead in 100 years. No one is going to live beyond about 100. Um, and the, the question is, why is that? Where in the hell does 100 years come from? We ought to be able to predict that. Why isn't it that no one in this room is going to live for 200 years or 1,000 years or a million years, and everybody here is old, has lived more than 10 years? So where does that come from? Which is already three times longer than a mouse can live, and yet you're made of the same stuff as a mouse. So why is that? Where does that come from? That's a coarse-grained question with a coarse-grained answer. And we can ask other ones like, what well, is aging? Why does this age? What happened here, uh, for example? Why do we need to sleep eight hours a night? No one in this room, I suspect, could get by with sleeping more than three or four hours a night. If you did, if you do, uh, you die. It uh, doesn't matter how much you eat and how, how healthy you try to keep yourself. Uh, but you don't have to sleep 15 or 16 hours like a mouse. Three or four hours, by the way, is how long an elephant has to sleep, and it does fine. Why is that? And so on. So here's, now we move back to cities in terms of these questions. Why is it, uh, first of all, are cities and companies like organisms? We often think of them that way. We think of them in sort of biological terms, the, the metabolism of a city, the DNA of a company, the ecology of the marketplace, and so on. But in particular, this interesting question, um, you know, it's extraordinary. We all die, as I said. All organisms die. All companies die. Uh, and if I have time, I will show you all the data on that. Google and, Google and Microsoft will eventually disappear. Yet Singapore and New York and London keep going. There's no evidence that they die. Almost no cities die. You drop atom bombs on cities and 25, 30 years later, they're fine. A diddly squiggle in the stock market and you lose a TWA, a General Motors and so on, a Lehman Brothers and so forth. Why is that? They the picture. So I want to just say a few words about some of the, the science of biology and I'm going to use that as a point of departure to then take it over and talk about cities and ask to what extent cities are biological and what we can learn from that and to what extent are they different than biology. So we are one of these. We vary by eight orders of magnitude from the shrew to the whale and yet we uh, have uh, very different evolutionary histories, otherwise we wouldn't look so different. Here's what's amazing, is that each of those animals has evolved with its own unique history. We all believe in natural selection. Um, each, each organ, each cell type, each genome in each of those animals has its own unique evolutionary history. So if you asked about any of their characteristics, if you measured anything about them, you would expect, given that everything was historically contingent, that there would be very little correlation between them. Um, and so if you plotted any quantity on a graph versus its size, the points would be all over the graph, uh, reflecting their unique evolutionary histories. Well, that turns out not to be true. And here's an example. This is the most fundamental quantity. By the way, not just for an organism, you, but also for every city and every company, that is its metabolic rate, how much energy, how many resources it needs to be maintained. And that's something that every organism has and one should be able to answer that for every system. So here it is, this is the metabolic rate versus size for a bunch of organisms and it's plotted on a logarithmic plot uh, so you can get a mouse and an elephant on the same graph. Um, and 
you see is something extraordinary, systematic, and regular has emerged, something unbelievably simple, uh, reflecting um, or, or coming from something that's maybe the most complex, diverse uh, process in the universe, namely metabolism. Um, and so that, that's the first astonishing thing. There's this unbelievable regularity underlying the apparent chaos, randomness, and messiness of natural selection. Uh, the other thing is that if you forgot about natural selection, and I asked you just simply, if you double the size of an organism, how much energy would the new one use, you would have thought, well, you double the number of cells, you need twice as much energy. No, that's not true. The slope of this line is roughly three quarters, which means every time you double the size, instead of needing twice as much met metabolic energy, you only need 75% as much. Every time you double, there's a 25% savings. So there's a systematic economy of scale. The slope of this being less than one is an indication of a systematic economy of scale. And uh, that is called, technically, a sublinear scaling. If you measure anything, anything that you can measure about an organism, and you plot it this way, the graphs all look like this. They all have this regular behavior. And I will show you a couple. Here's one. This is something mundane. This rate, heart rate versus size uh, for a bunch of mammals. Coming from, again from the mouse, it goes all the way down. And uh, this, this is, again, very regular, and the slope of this is minus one quarter. Um, so here's you. This is white to gray matter of your brain. You see how extraordinarily regular this is. Uh, the, you know, the white matter is the cabling, roughly speaking, and the gray matter is the uh, stuff that actually computes, so to speak. And uh, what you see is an extraordinarily regular behavior with a slope five quarters, roughly. Um, here's, uh, this has got more... Uh, variance in it. This is the length of uh, genomes versus size. And what you see, and I've written it down there, that's a best fit, is very close to one quarter. And what you see emerging um, systematically are these very simple so-called power law curves occurring in things that are unbelievably complex, um, showing that underneath the extreme, extreme complexity lies somewhere an extreme simplicity. And the question is, what is that simplicity? Typically, the other thing that emerges from this, that, uh, and I could show you 50 to 75 of such graphs, is that the slopes of all of them are simple multiples of one quarter, like the three quarters and the minus one quarter and the five quarters and so on. Um, here's one I couldn't help but put this in, and this is because I've already talked about death and mortality. And that's lifespan. Lifespan scales approximately with a slope of one quarter. That's the, the, the lifespan increasing as mass to one quarter. I've already said that heart rate decreases as mass to the one quarter, minus one quarter. So if you multiply these two together, the increase of lifespan is exactly balanced by the decrease of heart rate. And so there's no change. So heart rate times lifespan is the same for all mammals with beating hearts. Um, but what is heart rate times lifespan? That's the number of heartbeats in a lifetime. So the number of heartbeats in a lifetime is the same whether you're a shrew that lives for less than two years and has a heart rate of well over a thousand times a minute. Um, it's the same as a whale that lives for 150 years and his heart beats at uh, maybe 15 to 20 times a second, uh, a minute. And there's the data. That's the beats, but, and that's extraordinary. I mean, this is either some diabolical accident or something very deep about why it is you're all going to die in less than 100 years. It's all buried in this. So what's underlying? Where in the hell does all this come from? Why is it that trees and fish and birds and bacteria and you all scale in the same way? Well, the idea is that underlying it all is that we're all sustained by networks, and it is the mathematics and physics of networks that give rise to these scaling laws. And I, that's another whole lecture of itself. You just have to believe it, uh, or read my book, of course. <laughs> better to read the original papers, much better. So it is the networks, and uh, you know, here's just a, a bunch of networks. There are you, 
in the bottom there, and on the bottom left is you. That's your brain, that's your circuitry system, and uh, actually on the right is also you. That's inside cells and so forth. Um, I want to use this before returning to cities to something that is fundamental to cities, um, and that is growth. So we all, we've all done this, and so you recognize the growth. When you grow, you're scaling, and uh, as you can see here, and I don't have time to discuss the way in which you scale, but I do want to tell you a little bit about the way you grow, um, and you know how you do it, you know how you did do it. Um, that is, you ate, you metabolized, you sent that metabolic energy effectively through your networks. Your networks feed the cells. At the cellular level, what happens is that some of that energy goes to maintaining what's there, the cells that are there, including replacing ones that have died, and uh, therefore doing repair to, to damage that has occurred, and then adding new ones. And as I say that, you should think of cities and companies because they, don't, they work in not such a dissimilar way. And I'll come to that shortly. So there it is. There's just a little schematic of it. And I've written it slightly differently here. Uh, and this is, you put into an equation, that the incoming energy goes towards maintenance and growth. And you put that into a mathematical equation. You can solve it. And uh, what's beautiful about it is you get a, this is what you get. So here's the weight versus age for a rat. And those points are data. And that line is a prediction from the theory. And I'm going to jump ahead and say that this has universal parameters because it's a universal theory. So the same two or three parameters that determine that line determines the growth of everything else on the planet, believe it or not including you, and I will show you a graph of that in a minute. But here's the important point I want to emphasize here, and that is, you know you did this, you grew, and then you stopped. And the theory explains why you stopped, and that stopping is intimately related and derivable from the fact that you have this sublinear scaling, meaning economy of scale, given by the network constraints for your met metabolic rate, okay? That's where it all comes from. From all that network stuff, then goes right. Now, so this is great. So this explains why you stop growing. And, by, and uh, here's some other ones. The data isn't so good, but there's just a few. There's two, what is it? Two mammals, a fish, and a bird. And here, the theory tells you, if you rescale according to what the theory tells you, I do not have time to go into it, you rescale the size and the time in such a way, everything grows effectively at the same rate. Even though, of course, in real world, some uh, whale lives for 150 years and a mouse for uh, two or three. But if you rescale appropriately, and you can see there's a few outliers, but it's pretty damn good. And the theory predicts not only that they all fall on that curve, but the exact mathematical form of that curve. So that's, um, so by the way, you don't have to believe any of the theory. Uh, it's just uh, spiritually beautiful to see the great unity of life occurring in such a graph that we're all interconnected. And this is just some very small sampling of a bunch of animals. Okay, what's next? So here's a summary, and I'm going to take of biology, and I'm going to take over this paradigm into uh, cities and possibly into companies. So we had these nonlinear scaling laws dominated by this one quarter in the slope of those graphs in the exponent of the power law. They manifest an economy of scale. The bigger you are, the less energy is needed per cell or per capita to stay alive. The pace of life, I didn't stress this, but the other thing that comes along with it and is related to this economy of scale and, const and constrained by the network is the pace of life systematically slows. The elephant and the whale's heart beats much slower than yours or of the mouse, mouses in a systematic, predictable way. Growth is sigmoidal, meaning it grows quickly and then stops. And then you die. The theory predicts all of that, and it's all explained by the dynamics and mathematics of networks. And this is great, but it would be terrible in our present paradigm of our socioeconomic system we live in because we don't like the idea that we stop growing. It 
it's endemic that we need to be keep growing. And I now want to move into cities and into that whole paradigm to see how it differs from this and uh, also its relationship to sustainability because the fact that we start, everything stops growing and lives most of its life in a relatively stable state is one of the reasons why life has been so sustainable, sustainable for two to three billion years. Uh, socioeconomic systems have been around, even if you stretch it, for less than 10,000 years, and in the way we normally think about it for, for, for just a few hundred years. Okay, let's move on. So, with this paradigm, the first question we have to ask is, are cities scaled versions of one another? That is, the whale is a scaled up elephant, which is a scaled up giraffe, which is a scaled up human being, which is a scaled up mouse, despite the fact that the whale lives in the ocean and the elephant has a trunk and the giraffe a long neck and we walk on two feet and the mouse scurries around. We're scaled versions of one another if you actually look at the data and do what I just showed you up to 80, 90 percent, coarse grained on the average. Roughly, we're scaled versions of one another. Um, and the question then is, um, are cities within an urban system scaled, one, uh, scaled versions of one another? Is New York just a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up Santa Fe where I live? Despite the fact, like, like the animals, they look very different, they have different histories, geographies and cultures. Nevertheless, you could still ask the question, especially given this paradigm, when you realize that the scaling comes from networks and you realize that cities, of course, from this viewpoint, are nothing but a bunch of networks. There are lots of transport networks, uh, transporting people, but transporting electricity, water, and other resources, and so forth. Um, uh, there's undergrounds, transport, and there's this kind of transport you have here. Um, and there are supplied by network systems uh, and so forth. But, as I said at the beginning, this is the least interesting part of a city, but the part that we spend almost all our time thinking about is the infrastructure, uh, maybe because in some ways it's the simplest part of it, because this is really what a city is about. It's what we're doing here. It's the interaction between people and what happens in their lives and how they form societies and create the kind of fantastic phenomenon that we have around us. And this is just the social network graph. Each node is the person, and those lines, of course, are those the people they connect to. And um, one, the two things about the network, you've no doubt seen lots of these pictures of networks. And there's now a burgeoning science of networks, a lot of it started and uh, is, is very prominent at this, uh, among my colleagues at the Santa Fe Institute. So the first question is, are, are cities scaled versions of one another? So this is, uh, uh, this is the infrastructural part, and this is something relatively mundane. This is the number of gas stations, petrol stations, versus city size, plotted again in this logarithmic way, for a bunch of European cities. And what you see is, uh, as in biology, very, you know, it's good evidence of scaling. Um, and what you also see is that um, the slope of these lines are less than one. This would be one. So it's sublinear. So it's an economy of scale. Not surprising, the bigger the city, the less gas stations per capita are needed. But what you also see is the slopes of those are not so different. And in fact, if you look across the world, which we have done, at gas stations in countries uh, um, uh, from China and Japan, from uh, Colombia, Chile, I don't know, everywhere we could get data. They all look like this. They all have pretty much the same slope, and that slope is about 0.85. So the only difference with biology in this sense, this sense is that instead of a 25% saving on each doubling, you only get a 15%, but otherwise it's pretty much the same, and there's an economy of scale. But what is also interesting is that if you look at any other infrastructural quantity that you can measure, like the length of all the roads, the length of electrical lines, the water lines, whatever, whatever you can get data on that's infrastructural, it looks just like this. It's the same 15% savings every time you double, and it's the same everywhere across the globe where you can get data. So there's a kind of 
this remarkable universal behavior. That's very interesting. It's very similar to what we see in biology. But as I said, that's the least interesting part of a city. The most interesting part is stuff that didn't exist before we started talking to one another and forming communities. And these are things like, on the left here, is wages as a function of city size. And on the right are numbers of professional people, super linear, uh, super, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, super creative people, Richard Florida's term, as a function of size. And you can see there's more variance, but you can see very good evidence of scaling. But what you do see that is somehow is new is that instead of having an economy of scale less per capita, we got a slope bigger than one, and those are those numbers there, beta, the slope, and they're bigger than one, which means the bigger you are, the more per capita, doubling the size, you get roughly 15% more wages per capita. The bigger you are, you get 15% more sexy, super creative professional people, you're more creative, 15% more patents are produced, 15% another creative phenomenon, 15% more crime, 15% more police, tax receipts, everything that is socioeconomic that has no simple analog in biology increases by the same amount, even though it's completely different in many cases. And dare I say, it's the same across the globe. Look in Argentina, Look in Colombia, look in the uh, United States, look in China, Japan. It's always the same 15%. There's restaurants in Holland. So here's just a, uh, 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 six quantities from different countries plumped together. Just by eye, you can see they all scale in pretty much the same way, showing this slope approximately of about 1.15 with this 15% addition. And I don't know if you can read from there, but there's some of the things I've already shown. So here it is in English. The good, bad, and the ugly come together. On average, if you double the size of a city, you systematically increase all these marvelous things. Some of these good things systematically increase income, wealth, patents, colleges, creative people, but also police, AIDS, flu, crime, and so on. And, and at the same time, as that increase of 15% in, in socioeconomic activity and socioeconomic outcomes, you save 15% on all infrastructure. So cities are good. The bigger the city, the better from this viewpoint. So, um, uh, and, and indeed, you could speculate this is the reason why cities keep growing. That on the individual level, you gain, and you tend to repress the bad things about a city. But collectively, we gain because you need less infrastructure to support the same amount, and you get a 15% bonus by all that creativity and innovation and wealth that's being created. Grow, that's the thing. And that's why we've done it, it's marvelous. So, where does it all come from? How can it be that Peru and the United States and Japan and Portugal, which have never had, it wasn't, it wasn't as if in 1743, there was some major world convention that everybody got together and said, okay, the Industrial Revolution is just beginning and we're going to build hundreds of these new cities. Let's decide on some of the parameters of the urban systems that we're going to create. No, in the same way there isn't, in my, at least I don't believe, there isn't some old geezer up there who's a great engineer saying this is how we're going to design all these animals and plants so they go on doing what they do. No, it all happened by organic evolutionary process. And the question is, what is it? Well, going back to what I said earlier about biology, it's in networks. And uh, the idea is that here what's driving it is the universality of social networks and these things I talked about uh, of them earlier. And it is their nature. So here's that universality in the data this is income, GDP, crime, and patents all plotted on the same plot, adjusted, but you can see that they all have the same slope. Uh, you can see quite a bit of variance, but it's pretty good. Um, and the question is, how do you test this? Well, I'm not going to go into any, this is not the place to go into any theory, but you can, without knowing any theory, you can ask, how do you test this? Well, if they all come, if all of these disparate things come from social interactions, 
One critical test is to ask how many social, how does the number of social interactions between people change with city size? The prediction should be that it'd be just like this, because they're supposed to, it's supposed to have been derived from what we're doing here, social interaction. Well, how do you get that? That's been very hard to do until very recently. And now we have, of course, all of us carries one of these things around, of course, a, a little detector, so that everybody knows, so that someone knows exactly where I am and where I'm moving. Even when I move across this bloody stage, they probably can detect with this thing. And it's, there it is. And so this is fantastic data. And the cell phone companies, the telephone companies have this. And um, we were fortunate to collaborate with, uh, uh, some of you know him, Carlo Ratti at MIT with some of his young people. And one of my collaborators here, Marcus, Marcus, was a postdoc was one of my collaborators then, and we, what we did, and Marcus was majorly, majorly involved in this, uh, was you use that data, you analyze the billions and billions of phone calls, this big data set, um, and ask, uh, you know, um, how many people indeed, I mean, I, I call you, I call Will, and Will calls me back within six months, we call that a relationship. So we count those, roughly speaking, as a function of city size. And uh, here's the result. There it is there at the bottom. And you can see just by eye, it's pretty much the same slope as predicted. And the green and the red, uh, I'm sorry, the green and the blue um, are uh, data from the United Kingdom and from Portugal. Um, and that was, uh, that was very nice. It's a lovely uh, confirmation of the theory. Uh, one of the things we did not suspect, but it wasn't predicted by the theory, is the following. You can ask, how many of your friends talk to each other? So sort of getting to the modularity of your, the, the people around you. Uh, so this is, roughly speaking, how many people um, are, are interconnected of the people that talk to you? Um, and what we discovered in the data was that that doesn't change with city size. So it's sort of interesting. Even though your interactions are increasing rapidly, the bigger the city size, the people that you are sort of staying connected to and staying connected to each other is the same. And in this case, uh, down the bottom there, a small town of 10 to 12,000 people, which is a small, the, uh, small town in Portugal, as is in Lisbon near the end there, of over a, over a million people. So that this is, a, I think, extremely important in terms of understanding and creating the kind of life we want to have in cities, and that is that as we increase the incredible connectivity, there is this need to remain village-like, small and interactive. So if we design environments, buildings, blocks of flats, not to somehow understand, to take that into account, we are destined to create more social issues than we're already creating. Okay, so um, I think I'm probably running late. I think I might miss this out. This is another beautiful piece of work that Marcus and I have worked on, and it's uh, predicting. I will just show you this quickly. It's, it's you take, where are we? Here, we're in Singapore, that's right. You take this little area around here and you ask how many people coming to this little area around here are coming from a kilometer, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers away, um, once a week, twice a week, three times a week, once a year? You ask that question. R is the distance away, F is the frequency, and you can prove a little theorem that says it goes as the inverse square. If everything was ideal, which is amazing, a very simple, ridiculous result, and what is even more ridiculous is that that's what the data confirms using these billions of cell phone data. And here it is, uh, uh, roughly speaking, what I just said. That dotted line is the inverse square. It's for Boston, Singapore, Lisbon, and Dakar in Senegal, all the same. Completely different societies, uh, cultures, histories, but they all line up pretty much the same way. And then we deconstructed it. I think this is the one I want to show. This is, uh, that's Boston, that's Singapore. That's taking all the different areas of Singapore 
Those blue lines are the inverse square. And there, I can't read them here somewhere. You know, you take these little areas around. So this is a wonderful tool in principle if you're serious about urban planning. And it's not just rules of thumb that you have. Here's a, something. Not only do you have a theory, but you have the data to confirm it. Okay. So um, I got two more things I want to talk about, and then I'll stop. Uh, one is I just mentioned that in biology, the pace of life slows down uh, the bigger you are. Um, and that is to do with the... Um, that, that's related to the structure of the networks and the sublinear scaling. It turns out in social networks, oh, I have five, oh, that's very good. Good. Uh, the pace of life speeds up, and that's associated with the superlinear scaling, and we can understand it because the nature of our social networks are. I talk to Will, Will talks to Ting Chai. And Ty talks to Tom. He talks to me, and I talk back, and then you talk. And we talk, and we go around, and we build up. We build up ideas. We build up things. And we are very positive feedback. Lots of positive feedback in social interactions. That positive feedback is what, of course, not only leads to all the ideas and to the theory of relativity and Google, but it leads to things getting faster and faster. And I'm not showing you any of the theory, but you can understand that. And you feel it. You very much feel that viscerally. Okay. So the pace of life speeds up, and you can predict it. And on the left, I showed you the heart rates decreasing. On the right is some whimsical data taken in the 70s on the walking speed in various cities in Europe <laughs> by some people of Princeton, actually. And we plotted it this way. And there you can see, you know, there's lots of variance in it, but it's very, it's, it, I mean, there are lots of much more serious things we've checked the data on to show that uh, you can, you see this speeding up and uh, it's in agreement with the theory. And just again, a whimsical thing. This is from about a year ago. I saw this in the, in a British newspaper. It's a picture uh, you see of a street walking and I'll read it. You probably can't read it. I shall read. Research revealed almost half the nation, the United Kingdom, found the slow pace of high street to be their biggest shopping bugbear. Meaning, can you believe it? Half the people are upset at going shopping, mostly because the other people aren't walking fast enough. So this is a picture taken of the first day in Liverpool where they initiated a fast lane for walking which you might have to do in Singapore. So this is just a funny old manifestation of this phenomenon we all feel. Um, so I want to do the growth, and I'll try to finish up with this. Um, so it's the same thing as we had before. You eat. <laughs> so you eat, it brings in stuff, but it brings, it's much more complicated now. It brings in, uh, you know, all kinds of resources and then ideas and energy and so on. And I'm not going to go into all this, but get the idea, there's, a, there's analogous to the metabolic rate, there's a kind of social metabolic rate bringing in, and what does that do? It maintains what's there, it has maintaining the buildings and the roads, it maintains the people, it has to have doctors and hospitals, that's all part of maintenance, and then it grows new stuff, it builds new buildings and develops things, and it builds new people, either by uh, making them in the usual way, or people immigrate, but you make new people, that's part of growth, all of that has to be put together. I'm not, I'm not showing you any of the mathematics here, and, and, uh, uh, but the, the simpler version is actually biology, and I showed you that, this graph where sublinear scaling led to uh, bounded growth. Here, uh, this is just a cartoon for the moment, um, uh, what the theory predicts, if you take that equation, that, I, uh, that uh, statement of the equation that I just said a moment ago, and you put that into mathematics, instead of producing this, it produces this, which is great. That is zoom. You expand super exponentially, faster than exponential, which is actually what we've been doing, and that's great. 
So the theory is very consistent. Uh, the theory, the network theory, produces superlinear scaling, which we see, and superlinear scaling produces super exponential growth, which we see. So it's a very nice compact theory. It's very simple in, in principle. But it has built into it a, a fatal flaw. I don't think the theory does, but the implications of theory has a fatal flaw, and that's uh, illustrated by this dotted line, which in mathematics is called a finite time singularity. And what it means in English is that in some finite time, whatever it is you're measuring on this axis, any, any of these uh, metrics, could be the GDP, could be the number of AIDS cases, whatever, um, uh, uh, that will go to some infinite number in a finite time, which is obviously crazy. Can't do that. Um, that's because it's super exponential. By the way, if it's exponential, it's ex this is a side comment, if it's exponential, this is not a problem because it takes an infinite time to become infinite, technically, in, a, in an exponential. Super exponential, which is what is going on here, you do it in a finite time, meaning that in some finite time, it could be five years, 10 years, 100 years, you're going to have a problem because you're going to run out of something, inevitably. And the theory tells you what happens. It says, and that's what the right-hand side is, you go through the singularity, you stagnate, and collapse. So how do you avoid that? Well, we know how to avoid that. We've done it, again, by a cartoon. We would go, when we go along here, we recognize that we are assuming, and we are over short enough periods, it's true, that roughly speaking, nothing changes. We discovered uh, bronze a long time ago. That starts a whole cycle of things, a whole new paradigm. You discover coal. You discover oil, you invent computers, you invent IT. Each of these um, is a major innovation. And what it does is during that period, uh, this is how it grows. And that, that gives you a hint as to how you avoid collapse, which would happen here. And that is that somewhere along here, you better make a major paradigm shift to avoid the singularity. And then you can take off again. And of course, the same phenomenon would occur again. You would collapse if you don't reinvent yourself and start over again, and so on. And you have the same. So you have this kind of theorem that you can prove. If you demand open-ended growth, then what you must have is not just cycles of innovation, but that um, uh, cycles of paradigm shifts. But here's what's also important, is that they are accelerated. The time between here and here is always longer than here, the next one. So the time to the next paradigm shift in, when you reinvent yourself uh, and make a major innovation is going to be less than necessarily the time from the last one, and that's less than the time before, in a systematic way. So that's what the theory says, if you just follow it through. And this is not mine. I have no idea who this guy is. But I found it on the web, and it just looked like what I had said. So I show it. And uh, what's nice about it, is if you take the number, is how long did it take for, uh, to have 10 million customers on the cable, on the fax, and so on. So it was just an arbitrary metric this guy invented. And uh, here they are. This gets shorter and shorter to get to 10 million. And if you take these numbers, they follow exactly the prediction of the theory. And even more so, if you take this, the word singularity has come associated with this man, Ray Kurzweil, who has this uh, somewhat, in my mind, and I don't mind saying publicly, loony idea that very soon we're all going to be cyborgs, and that's what the next paradigm shift is. Um, uh, but in fact, so he, but this is his graph, basically. And he didn't put this in, but these are all these things down here. And what this is, so that everybody's on the same page, this is um, when the paradigm shift happened, how long it took to happen. So, Cells took um, a billion years, almost a billion years, to evolve, and it happened, roughly speaking, a billion years ago, and so on, all the way down here to here. The internet happened about 10 years ago, I mean, on this scale, 10, 20 years ago, and it took, you know, less than 10 years to evolve. All on the same graph. 
And that line is exactly what's predicted by this theory that I told you. So this is somewhat speculative, but there it is. Uh, the data, it's supported by the data. And so the question is, when you go back to this, you are suddenly confronted with an, a reductio ad absurdum argument that sooner or later, and in fact sooner, you're going to have to be innovating on a kind of, not just every 15 or 20 years, but every five years, and then every year. I mean, not just innovating, an innovation as big as the internet. It's nuts. So if you believe this, that's what's going to happen. And the data supports, I don't know, it's speculative, but it's good to be left with that. Nevertheless, you can think of a, this is, I've expanded the argument now to the entire system, but at, a, at an individual and city level, this is also true. That you need always to be, if you want to sustain yourself with open-ended growth, this is what you need to do. And um, I just show you here a bunch of, this is just arbitrary data I picked up. But I want to show you some data. This is in the eyes of the beholder. This is New York City. And this is some analysis we did <laughs> trying to eke out these paradigm shifts, and we did it, that's what these lines are, and what this is, is showing the deviations from a nice smooth curve of population growth, um, and showing that these shifts up and down, the, it has a cyclical behavior, which is getting, whose frequency is getting faster and faster, so we just did a very detailed analysis. <laughs> the only way we do it is to innovate, and... Um, that innovation and positive feedback leads to collapse. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of paradigm shift can we do to get out of it? And that paradigm shift has to be qualitatively different than all previous paradigm shifts, because when we think of paradigm shifts and innovation, we inevitably think of technology. Every paradigm shift that was mentioned there in terms of modern era is technology internet, driverless cars, etc. The next paradigm shift, or one of the next paradigm shifts, has to be a social cultural change. So I'll leave you with that thought. Apologize for going on so long. Thank you. It's always such a privilege to hear Professor West talk, and I, I don't think you went on too long. I wish you went on longer, because there were so much interesting insights. You know, um, I saw this quote from Rolling Stone that uh, characterized Santa Fe Institute as the Justice League of renegades who are, oh no, the, the geeks who are thinking of all the big questions. So it's really amazing to see how Professor West brings the you know, ideas from biology and physics into cities and really try to address the question of complexity in cities. And it's quite beautiful how some of the equations turn out you know, in all your investigations and explorations that there are these super linear and sublinear rules that uh, kind, of, kind of address them. Um, one question is this, this question of bounded growth. Have, have we by now found any clear sign of the tipping point? What is the tipping point? Is it a population size? Um, or is it other network kind of effects that would, that would Give us some clue to what is the tipping point. Well, uh, is this on? Yes. Yep. Um, yeah, that's, of course, the crucial question is, uh, I mean, the crucial question is, uh, in a way, uh, I'm interpreting your question any anyway this way, that, um, you know, can we devise a set of metrics that um, we can use to tell us, you know, it's sort of right there. It's going to happen in the next five or ten years. Um, I don't know really the answer to that other than to do the kinds of analyses that uh, we've done here. Um, but, um, you know, I think the, the, the one thing in, uh, this doesn't tell you at all, really, is uh, what the nature of the, you know, the next tipping point is going to be. Um, all it tells you is that there has to be one, with, what it does say is within a certain period of time. And here, in this case, it's about 25 years. So within the next, actually less, it's, uh, it's about 30 years from when you might think the IT really took off. Um, and uh, we have no idea what that might be, but there will be one, um, I believe. 
uh, and um, uh, you know it could be it could be something as again I use the word mundane as driverless cars because it's not very sophisticated in a way but that could have very profound effects on the way we live in our cities and the way we design our lives. Um, I'm skeptical of that, frankly. I mean, I think that it's a wonderful idea, but I'm skeptical that we can do it. But I, so this in no way predicts it. But I do think uh, what I try to present here was, you know, a big framework with the um, trying to be a little bit tantalizing to say that uh, what's really required here is much more in-depth research than has been done, much, much more. This is just uh, scraping the surface, really, uh, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's, it's, um, and, and it's, and it needs to be thought through with um, uh, people from um, many different academic disciplines, but also, equally importantly, from many different kinds of practitioners. You know, such as yourself, for example, the people that are dealing with uh, many of these problems. But um, uh, and my pessimism, to be honest, is that uh, we're not doing that. You know, we're not. There isn't sort of a um, well. I I once used the phrase a grand. We need to devise <laughs> a grand unified theory of sustainability, and it should have the same urgency. It should have not the same. It should have much much more urgency than we had, say, uh, than the US had with uh, the Manhattan Project and the building the atomic bomb or even the Apollo program to send a man to the moon. I think uh, it, it needs to be much more urgent than that and is, and is, in fact, much more urgent, I believe. And I'm disappointed that it's hard to get traction, certainly within the United States, but even internationally, to have this sort of bigger picture approach integrated with the necessary work, which is most of it actually, done in the trenches on the details. I think that's why I'm pretty excited about the MOU that CLC yeah. has signed with SFI. I think that's potential there that we can really use complexity yeah. science as a way to better inform how city planning and city planning policies could be driven and to look at it not in a reductionist way, which is typically the kind of more silo approach that has been taken to urban planning science, but to look at it more holistically. So, but it'll be a journey because yeah. it's a journey of discovery. The answers are not quite there yet. No. I think we will work quite closely. No, I'm very excited about it actually because I think uh, I mean Singapore is a first is a you know is a wonderful case study, wonderful lab uh, from a scientific viewpoint, and there's the possibility of getting some really detailed data that can feed into this, and at the same time. You know, um, you have a you know a country, a city, an administration that really has had a history and um, has maintained that history of wanting to solve some very important problems, and is in a very unique position on the globe, of course. Well, I'm happy to see that many of our fellow agencies are on board with us, and really interested to see how we can use complexity science to to kind of look at that. Uh, maybe at this juncture, I'd like to open up the, the questions Q&A to the floor. Please uh, identify yourself and pose your questions. Alina, please, on, on the left. And then this gentleman on the my left yeah. later. I know you. <laughs> Alina Chan. Please. Yes. Hi. I did. Simon, Hello. several questions, but I'm limited to two. Uh, please identify yourself, Alina, in case the others don't know you. Uh, I'm Alina Chan from the National Transport. Uh, two questions. One, you mentioned that we have to shift our paradigm shorter and shorter period of time. But our biology, our physiology yes. can't cope with that kind of a change. So how do we then put this change in paradigm shift at the rate? Because at the present moment, the paradigm shifts are already uh, putting such a toll on our mental health and physical health. So that's question number one. Number two, if the paradigm shift doesn't happen, what's going to happen? Does that mean that all the whole world will collapse, cities will collapse, or will more resilient cities survive? What would happen? How 
Well, they're both, they're both, of course, very good and extremely challenging questions. Uh, the first one, <laughs> uh, and they're connected, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, to, to try to address the first one. Yes, I completely agree with you. And if I'd had even more time, I would have talked a little bit about that. I would have mentioned that, that it's one of the big issues is that we're, you know, um, we're, we've, our social interactions have sped up what we call time. You know, what we, uh, you know, the, the, the time we use on our daily basis is this weird time that's to do with the Earth spinning on its axis and going around the sun. But we've created this new time, which is this treadmill time of getting faster and faster uh, from social interactions. And at the same time, um, our biological times have remained essentially constant, um, including you know, our neurological development is, we're, you know, roughly speaking, identical to hunter-gatherer human beings of 10, 20, 50, 100,000 years ago. And yet, you know, we have to adapt faster and faster. And um, uh, that is no doubt the cause. In fact, I'm surprised there isn't even more dissociation and uh, loss of meaning. I don't know what words to use, but uh, that, that we're seeing, even though we are seeing a lot of it every, every, across the globe. But it does uh, play into your second question, uh, which is I don't, obviously don't know the answer to that uh, exactly, other than I think the first signs of it will be significantly more social unrest. I think social unrest I think, in fact, I interpret a lot of the social unrest uh, that we see across the globe as actually a reaction to this problem of speeding up time. And I also see the uh, migration of, um, especially in, uh, you know, in the United States and now in, in Europe, the, the political migration to more autocratic rule uh, as being also a reflection of the, uh, this, this feeling of out of control that people feel. Because it's sort of extraordinary when you think about it. Uh, the standard of living has continued to rise. You know, I mean, it's uh, 80, you know, just continuous rise. It hasn't been any major drop. Um, you know, some people are certainly being left behind. But their standard of living is, is of, of people near the bottom is probably higher than a, a significant m uh, number of people 50 years ago. You know, much, you know, maybe 30, 40%. You know, the whole thing has gone up. Yet people are feeling dissatisfied. And that's, of course, to do with the fact that the differential is getting bigger. But I also believe that it's to do with this fact of um, being on this accelerating treadmill, not being able to keep up. It's, uh, you know, I think uh, we all feel it to varying degrees. <laughs> Uh, I certainly do. You know, I'm quite old now, and uh, uh, you know, it just I just get so irate uh, having to learn things. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think one of the great achievements of my life was to be able to learn to to write in tech at a, at a fairly advanced age, uh, and then to learn how to uh, do. Um, I can't even remember what it is, but you know, all the very marvelous things you have to do on social media. And that was that's quite something to learn, you know, when you're getting old. Uh, and, you know, enough is enough already, but it keeps going. <laughs> I, and this is tongue-in-cheek I'm talking, obviously. I mean, um, it's also, you know, there's a, there's a positive side to that because um, it's also very uh, satisfying, of course, to be able to learn new things. But I think in the general public, I think we have this, this problem of feeling out of control. Let's take the so next I question. Oh, so, so <laughs> yeah. minute, I just want to finish up one okay, thing. Cool. I, I don't know what the answer is, yeah. obviously, to what, the, what happens if we don't make it through. <clears throat> Things will collapse, I believe. Do you think cities will collapse? Or well, the I think uh, country, the countries will collapse. I think some, some will remain, some not. But I think social unrest will dominate everything. That's, that's why I think it's sort of so hard to speculate. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and you can speculate about what the end result might be in the worst possible case, you know, that we have, uh, 
nuclear war or that we end up being hunter-gatherers again, which actually being hunter-gatherers again might be great for all I know. I mean, they, people say they <laughs> lived a very, uh, you know, that may not be so terrible. So I don't know. They're very good questions. And let's and take a question a on site. <laughs> Your next book, <laughs> Professor West. Okay. Andre Chazar, O Design Research and Consulting. Uh, I really appreciated your comment about the need for paradigm shift and pointing out that the necessary paradigm shift is probably not going to be technological, but rather social or sociological. So I'm wondering whether you might uh, consider a certain kind of innovation as potentially <clears throat> filling that bill. Let's say we talk about closing the loops. You talked a lot about metabolism and the waste products obviously present in most metabolic processes. So what if we really work on closing the loop so that what is today waste actually becomes an input, sort of radical recycling, cradle to cradle, whatever. Do you think that's <clears throat> far enough from being a purely technological solution to do what you think needs to be done? Well, I'm all for what you say. I mean, I'm very, very enthusiastic about uh, the idea of uh, a closed loop. Yeah, closed loop. Seeing a closed loop system, and uh, you know, um, and certainly, you know, it seems a no-brainer that we have to move from fossil fuel to uh, renewable and so forth. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's built into the physics of the system that you can't go on, you know, just um, with. Uh, burning stuff that's around you, and you have to also at the same time do what you said, is see the waste as potential fuel or potential resource for something. But I, I, I would say, first off, I see that as a technological solution. On the other hand, it has, it has a, a presupposition in it that is, uh, that is social and revolutionary. Because um, I don't think uh, that, I don't think any society has operated that way, you know. Even you know um, very uh, early societies, I don't think operated at all that way. Um, so it does require it would require a radical revolutionary shift in the way we think about who we are and our relationship to each other and the environment. So in that sense, uh, it could be it could be what you say. Um, and um, but it it also requires, I think, and I might be wrong in this, that uh, you know I I've sort of concluded as I started thinking about this, and so, especially when I wrote my book, was that um, I began to see this greed as sort of the most fundamental motive of what's going on. That is, we all, including me, want more. In, of whatever it is, you know, I mean, I have much more than I need. And yet I still, you know, I don't, it's not conscious, but I sort of unconsciously want more, you know. And that seems to drive most people. And uh, there somehow is a linkage between that and not taking care of one's waste. If you saw, I mean, I, I'm not articulating it very well, but so somehow I think your cultural revolution requires also the revolution of being less narcissistic, less self-oriented, and less greedy. So what we need, I think, is a, um, a sort of anti-Trump, <laughs> if you see what I mean. I mean, because he manifests all those other things many of which have brought us to this place. I think he's, you know, what, what he manifests is sort of one's image of rampant 19th century individualistic capitalism, which, you know, for all its faults, brought us, to all, to, brought us a lot of this. Um, and he is sort of returning to that stage, including, you know, America first and uh, all the rest of that stuff. Uh, so somehow, if we had someone with his charisma that could, I mean, he, what he did, it's not him. He awakened in people what was already there. It's not, you know, we all have that. And so he 
brought that to consciousness. What we now need is the opposite to that, to bring the things that you're talking or implied in what you're saying to consciousness. I mean, it sounds a bit flaky, but you know, to love and <laughs> humanistic values and caring for others and caring for the environment, believing in truth, believing in science and so forth, all those things. We need a sort of, um, you know, a, a Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King or Jesus Christ or, I don't know, some messianic person that sort of galvanizes that positive side of the human spirit uh, to, to do what you're saying. And that is revolutionary. Not that all of those people didn't bring along with them also unintended consequences, by the way, as a cautionary note. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, one last question here in the front. Hi, well, Craig Tong Boon from the National Robotics Program at MTI. <clears throat> I want to get a view on whether the scaling laws that you mentioned will need to be revisited uh, if we reach a stage where there's convergence between biological biology and physics. For example, there's a hypothesis that the uh, evolution, today we're talking about evolution being dominated by the law of natural selection. What happens if there's a stage, natural natural oh, natural yes. natural stage where not only law of natural selection influences evolution, but maybe the law of uh, inorganic life, not necessarily for us to become a cyborg. For example, with a lot more precision medicine today, uh, we are able to live longer without the uh, heartbeat becoming slowing down, for example. And what is the impact of that on the growth of seed? So what's the, I didn't understand the, I didn't understand the question. So the first question is whether we need to revisit the scaling law. Whether we can what? We need to revisit the scaling laws. Oh, whether we can. Where you see a stage where there's a convergence between biology and physics. Because we are talking about technologies like AI and robotics coming that is now able to influence uh, society in, a, <laughs> oh, in so a more subtle and deeper so manner I, than in the past. I interpret example. you say, can we become more biological? Oh, no, 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 I didn't say that. No, I said that, social behavior. Yes, social behavior. That's what I know, I understand. Yes, social behavior. Yes. yes. Whether so, that will, because of that, we need to revisit. You could, yes, no, yeah. I agree. No, and I think yeah. that is the question. Correct. Uh, that is, no, but that is the question. Yes. <laughs> it's, not, it's not just your question. Yeah. And I don't know the art because we, we, in that sense, you know, this is a bad way of saying it, you know, what we discovered, which was so phenomenal, sort of violated those rules. I mean, it didn't violate, obviously it didn't violate them because it exists, but, but it, it went outside of, the, of what had evolved by natural selection. And, um, you know, the question is, can we, I mean, the, the way I've often thought about it, can we get, could, is it conceivable to get back to that so that we have the sustainable part of biology and yet have this? I think that's, that's the way I think about it. That is, have this kind of socioeconomic life that we have. And um, it's, it's, to put it slightly differently, um, you know, the way I've often thought about it is that, um, you know, I don't know how many Nobel Prizes there are in economics. There's about, um, I suppose there's 120. I don't know, whatever there have been. But, you know, I think if you scratch the surface of any one of them, built into it is the assumption that you have an open-ended growth forever. Right? That's sort of built into the whole idea. And, um, bio and economists have um, rationalized that by saying that um, uh, you can have an open-ended growth because and, uh, and stop a collapse coming from exponential growth uh, by continuously innovating. So they just, it's a mantra, it's like a mantra. Innovate, and was, even though as far as I can tell, they know very little themselves about innovation and technology, but they're willing to say that's what's going to happen. Because, and and you know that's been true, and that's why all the you know people that have come before and uh, said you know we're doomed or you know we're 
the world's going to collapse, have been wrong, uh, rightly, rightly criticized because they, th those arguments um, ignored the, the whole creative process of innovation. Um, I, uh, and I'm very conscious of that. Uh, uh, and that's why I use the word, what I'm talking about, I'm speculating, obviously. But uh, the, the point is that if you take into account innovation that gets you out of the problem, um, you still have this problem that you have to innovate faster and faster. So there's a new problem has occurred, and that is the fact that time has speeded up. So uh, going back to uh, your question more specifically, um, you know, that is not, that is something that's outside of biology. And unless you can somehow find an economic system that has no growth, but still has built into it wealth creation and the maintenance of the quality and standard of living, you can't do, you can't do that. And that's why I think the only way we can do it is, is two things. One is we need to think in terms of a revolutionary change in social cultural behavior coupled with a, a um, major effort to bring together the various stakeholders in terms of the academic community and the practitioners to start to think seriously about the question of sustainability, everything from the local scale, how do you sustain this neighborhood, how do you sustain Singapore, to the question of how do you sustain the planet. And I think until we sort of focus on that, until we get that dialogue going and get a serious program going, I'm, I remain quite pessimistic. Because I don't, you can't do, I, I believe you can't do what you're hoping you could do. Well, Professor West, uh, given that we don't really know where the next paradigm shift or innovation is coming from, um, I guess it would be good to hear from you what advice you would have for, say, policy makers and urban planners as to what, what's the shape of the program that you talk about to, to strengthen our resilience and no ability to be sustainable going forward. Well, I mean, I think, of course, you're doing many of the things already. I mean, you are, um, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking of the various things that are threatening. Um, but um, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak to Singapore because I don't know. But um, my concern is much more that um, there's a systemic problem here. You know, it's not, there are individual issues. You know, I'm even concerned that if we just, in quotes, focus on um, uh, climate change as, you know, the issue, I think that's, uh, you know, that's very worthy and I'm obviously, I would be, I am very supportive and even work on it. But, um, I think unless that's seen as integrated with everything else, um, where we won't solve these problems. Either we won't solve them, certainly won't solve them globally, but we won't solve them locally. I think locally we also have to think of them in much more integrated terms. So it's, it's again, you know, on a local level, doing what I hope this MOU will end up doing is bringing together the various stakeholders and the people that have been concerned, everything from you know, the roads and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the rising sea levels to um, what are you going to do with uh, uh, the fact that people are living longer um, and so on. All these various things that come in that different agencies, for example, typically deal with, really bringing them together but to start getting a uh, much more con bigger conceptual framework so that we can start to generate a sort of matrix in which we see how all these things are interconnected to formulate a policy so that we can mitigate unintended consequences. Because you'll never get rid of unintended consequences, but uh, really um, minimize unintended consequences of the various actions that are typically taken. Yeah. I think in Singapore, we're already planning in a fairly integrated yeah. and holistic manner. So complexity science, what it offers is to give us a better framework and potentially more tools that we can yeah. tap on to explore the different dimensions of how the issues will interrelate and, and yeah. impact each other. So, the, so that's a very promising angle that we hope to give us more insights on.
And I think with that, we'll call it to the end since we're running out of time. <laughs> and uh, just a plug for the NTU Complexities of Time workshop next week. There's a whole bunch on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday over at NTU that Professor oh, yeah. West will also be speaking at one of the sessions as well. So you can look online, NTU Complexities of Time next week. Yep. And read my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it's a very good read, I must say, uh, Professor West. <laughs> the book is uh, very readable, very interesting. So do, do take an take a opportunity to read that book. Okay, back to the MC meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Huang and uh, Professor West, for the lively and engaging discussion. Could we give a round of applause for the two of them? So for everyone for this discussion.